This podcast is not legal advice and should not be relied upon as such. You should always obtain legal advice about your specific circumstances. Welcome to Hall & Wilcox's cyber podcast, CyberZone. I'm Eden Winnicker, a partner and head of cyber at Hall & Wilcox. For season two, episode three, I'm delighted to be joined by David Lacey. David is the founder and managing director of Australia's leading identification protection service and not-for-profit ID Care. Today's episode is titled Cyber and Identity Protection, the Rise and Importance of ID Care. David, welcome and thank you for joining me. Thanks, Eden, and it's great to be in the cyber zone. <laughs> Very good. Now, David, to, to get started, I wanted to, 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 to ask you this. You know, for many years, I've seen the name ID Care on the uh, Office of the Australian Information Commissioner or OAIC's website, uh, listed as a service that individuals who have suffered a data breach can contact for assistance. Uh, we're going to come to that in a little bit, but before we dive into that, can you provide our listeners with the story about how ID Care was founded and tell us a bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. So ID Care, I guess, formally kicked off about 10 years ago. So in 2013, I was working in the Commonwealth Government at that stage and, and working principally in a function that was targeting organised crime, committing uh, most of them are cyber crimes and, and data breach events against our community. And at that stage, the Attorney General uh, asked whether there was an interest in doing a bit of a feasibility study on what uh, the community might need by way of remediation and, and support. So after 10 years of, of really interesting work working in the government, uh, I thought it was a good opportunity from a career perspective to kind of uh, turn my mind not to the criminal but but to the victim. So did a feasibility study for a good 12 to 14 months. It was pretty apparent during that time uh, that the community that we engaged with right across Australia and then New Zealand were in need of a central place to turn to, uh, to assist them in trying to understand the risks to them, but also navigate a pretty unforgiving system. And then the question that was asked at the time really was, should it be within government or should it be independent or external to government? Uh, should it be commercial? So all of those considerations were made at the time and, and where it all landed really was uh, surprisingly from the government representatives on that steering group was it should be outside of government. It should be an independent voice. It should have uh, an arm's length from government because government in a way uh, had a pretty critical role in terms of response, but as did the private sector. So a body that kind of sat out of that was was the recommended path, and that's the journey we took. And and it was it was the right decision reflecting on it. You know, it it, it sure there is I think one in four dollars that comes into ID Care comes to ID Care because we're delivering services to government. There are people from government that are on our board, uh, but by no means is the government kind of saying, and IDK, you need to say X, Y, and Z, and IDK, you need to do this. It's a very hands-off uh, relationship, which has been preserved now for a good decade, and, and it works. So so that's that's the history we launched in 2014 formally. Uh, 2014, we had our first data breach <laughs> come in. Obviously, since the legislation changed in the Commonwealth in 2018, there's been a rapid uh, increase in the number of people that are coming to IDK because their data's been breached. But it's not everything we do. We support victims of scams. That's probably most of the work. We support people who have no idea how criminals got their data and are experiencing extreme misuse. And we obviously support people that are being notified about data breaches and, and what that might mean for them. That's, I mean, that's an incredible journey. And, you know, when you think about the current, the state of affairs, in 2013, when it came to cybercrime, data breaches, scams compared to now, it's really exploded over that decade. And uh, just for, for the benefit of the listeners, the reference to the Commonwealth law that came into effect, it's the that was the mandatory data breach notification laws that came in in uh, February 2018, which 
uh, really required from a Commonwealth perspective, notification by companies who've had a data breach to the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner and affected individuals when it met a certain threshold. That, that's, I mean, that, that you raise a number of really uh, interesting and important issues there. And one, one that I think I wanted to ask you about is really what criminals can do with stolen data. This is something that that clients ask, you know, also friends and family might, you know, knowing, knowing the area that I practice law in, they'll, they'll sort of say, well, what, what can criminals do if they've got my name and, and driver's license number? You know, someone in your perspective will be particularly well-placed to talk to this. So from your perspective, what are the risks posed to individuals who have had their personal information accessed or published during a data breach? Yeah, the risks are multiple and it's not just financial. So one of the things we've learned over the last decade is the risk environment changes. And if anything, in the last 24 to 36 months in particular, we've seen really the weaponization of personal information. So we've seen a growth in ransomware attacks, so threat actors obtaining access to organisational systems, exfiltrating data, not just encrypting it uh, as part of that ransom you know, uh, threatening to release that information publicly. And we've seen examples of that in recent times in the most abhorrent way. Uh, now, that, that's that been an evolution that hasn't, you know, just appear, appeared. It's It's been building for some time. How criminals can exploit the personal information of someone, it comes down to a few things. One is, obviously, what is the information that's been exposed? If it's a government-issued credential and it's a photographic credential that's leaned upon by many organisations to determine whether someone might be eligible to a product or service in part, then that that presents a higher transactional risk. But that, having said that, even the type of product or service that we see criminals exploit changes. So we've seen, particularly in the last two years, buy now, pay later, and cryptocurrency wallets gain prominence in terms of identity exploitation, whereas prior to that, we really didn't see it. Um, The mainstays you would see would be unauthorised access to financial accounts, again, depending on what information is exposed, the exploitation of payment cards, uh, application of personal loans, uh, telecommunication service offerings being exploited, the list is quite long, but if, if anything, it, it does change in terms of what criminals are emphasising and exploiting. And the flip side to that, which is equally important and equally important for incident responders, is the response system changes. So there are risks that can be treated ahead of notification. There are risks that the impacted person can only treat, and there are some risks that can't be treated. And maintaining a knowledge of that is is a is of critical importance. It's something that is ID Care's bread and butter. But the last thing that we need to do is to provide someone that comes into ID Care the wrong advice. And so we need to make sure that we've got a team of people that are constantly testing our response system affordance. And that's another reason why we're independent of government, because part of the response system affordance comes from government. And and we found early on with ID Care the reason why independence was a good decision to make was because that we had some parts of government giving us an aspirational policy view of what they thought response was. And yet when we tested it or the community member reflected upon their experience with us, it was a very different reality. And we deal in reality. We need to prepare people for that uh, real experience they're going to have, not just the aspirational policy goal. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, one thing I think that that's really helpful to, to understand, and that that's uh, not dissimilar to, to the answer that I give it. It's, it's really you know, understanding what's going on, how, how data you know, or the, the use of it by criminals has evolved over time. And, you know, I think the, the, the key takeaway for me is that organizations of all sizes really just need to do their best to protect the information. Um, that's the starting point. And then and then really make sure that they're there to help the individual if something does go wrong. Now, I think you, you touched on this before. That that is sort of the different types of services that that ID Care offers. Um, you know, for for many people listening, they will have heard of ID Care. Some won't have. Can you 
could you provide a bit more detail around the, the, the actual services that ID Care provides and, and how, do, how does the organisation help people who, who get in touch with you when they're the victim of, let's just say, a data breach? And we can also look at scams, which are just prevalent at the moment. But from a data breach perspective, what are the sort of services that ID Care offer and how do you support the individual? Yeah, I think first and foremost is a place of expertise that people can turn to to understand, well, if this is the information I've been notified that's been exposed from an ID care perspective, what does ID care see are the risks and what are the response affordances available to me at this particular point in time? And that 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 service can't be understated because of the evolution and 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 how things do change over time. It's it's an unforgiving role in some respects in terms of responding to people that have been notified about a breach uh, in relation to case management, which is our core business. So that's the provision of somebody that has expertise that can have a confidential conversation with an individual about their concerns and needs because we can all do as much work as possible in trying to understand the risk to people and what the remediation options are but you'll always have someone that has pretty unique circumstances that may not be predicted. And, and that, could, that could relate to things that you and I might think is quite innocuous when it comes to a breach. So a name and an address, you can't get a personal loan with someone's name and address. You need other details. But for some people, that is actually enough for them to experience serious harm because there might be good reason why their address should be concealed. So so having an outlet that can have these conversations in a confidential way where people aren't charged, it's not the organisation that's responsible for the breach, it's an organisation that's independent of that, uh, is, a, is a valued service. We also, for other victims of personal information compromise and exploitation, such as scam victims, extend support via Cyber First Aid. So we have a team that uh, look to remediate devices for individuals uh, without charge to them. And we get these horror stories coming in where people are saying, well, you know, X organisation said I had to take it to the IT shop. The IT shop charged me $1,300 to do a factory reset on my phone. You know, it's it's the Wild West. So so we, we've, we've worked with government to look at ways of which we can provide the community with a cyber first aid service with the blessing of the client to have a look at their device and have a look at their device, not just from a malware perspective, because most scammers aren't using malware, but look at the things that we know scammers do on devices, such as create uh, hidden account access points, have remote access software persistent in the background without you knowing it, create email forwarding rules, do all sorts of things that your antivirus provider won't, won't pick up, and yet will still render the device at risk. So Cyber First Aid for us started really with survivors of family and domestic violence coming to ID care concerned that they were being surveilled or there was spyware or other types of applications on their device. And we developed a, a service around supporting members of the community that were fearful of that. And that, by extension, then became the basis for us to look at scam victims, and in particular scam victims that had provided remote access to their devices. So, so the thing that kind of keeps me really motivated with id care is that it, it's not, not static it keeps evolving and it evolves to ironically the threat actors different forms of exploitation and the response systems are uh, constant changing and and it's kind of never the one set of rules or advice that remains the same it, it, it continues to evolve yeah I, I mean it's a it's a really a terrific service the 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 horror stories that i've heard in my Day to day from just, you know, whether it's businesses or, or individuals who have been scammed or defrauded or victims of data breaches, you know, sometimes in the most, you know, horrific of circumstances and, and, and real concerns about their address being impacted, what that might mean for their safety or well-being. It, it really can be, you know, very difficult situations and it's, it's great that there is an organisation out there helping helping the individuals. I wanted to sort of turn the focus away from the individual for a moment and 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 to corporations or to organ you know big business uh, and then also just just then to come to SMEs but you know ID ID cares name featured during the responses to 
you know, the largest data breaches we've seen in recent memory in Australia. And by that reference, I'm talking about Optus, Medibank and Latitude. Uh, and, and we don't need to get into the specifics of, of any of those three, but for all three of those breaches, uh, you know, ID care was offered to, to impacted individuals. Uh, uh, and, 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 and those are breaches, you know, dealing with millions of potentially impacted individuals. So I think it's fair to say that ID care is the clear market leader when it comes to identity protection and counselling services in Australia following data breaches. Before we dig into a few things I wanted to ask you about those matters, what are some of the factors that have allowed ID care to have so much success, you know, really to, to be in the position where you're being, you know, your organisation is the one that's being turned to by these large corporates? And, and also, what are some of the challenges you've seen along the way? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know whether we see it as success, <laughs> having <laughs> 14 people being told to call our number. I think uh, in, in a way it is flattering that, that government and, and, and the breached organisations uh, obviously trust us enough to, to carry and support the impacted person. So that is, that's not something that we, uh, we're not proud of. We are. I, I think part of the reason why we're singled out probably goes back to one of our core foundational values and that is our independence i think people when they're receiving breach notifications from organizations some will look at it and not think it's real others will kind of look at it and just park it and, and you know hope for the best and not do anything others though will be quite interested and those that are motivated to pick up the phone to have a discussion with id care ironically will want to just validate what's in the notification letter and will kind of want that more independent view on on what it means for them. Some some may confuse ID care with a breached organisation and, and let our poor staff have it, and <laughs> and uh, you know that that can be a quite uh, a thankless role for our team. Who are at pains of saying, well, we're not the breached organisation, but we can, and and are more than happy to provide support and insights as to what it might mean to you. So I think I think the value of that service today is amplified because I think uh, the community since September 2022, half our country has been breached. Mm. Half the country has uh, received a notification or will shortly uh, that their personal information has been breached. They see, they see the government credential side of that. Some are reflecting on, well, why is government letting this happen or why are my government ID documents used in this way? And so there's a tainting of government uh, as well as obviously a, a negativity towards the breached organisation on why they might have hung under my details for so long or, you know, how did this happen? So we sort of swim in this lane that's uh, arm's length of that and just gives people an outlet. And for the big breaches of the multi-million person magnitude, then then part of our response is a digital one. You know, it's to give them a place online to go to, to go, well, what does ID Care reckon? You know, what's the advice ID Care is providing today? And sometimes that's consistent. Sometimes that's inconsistent with government. You know, we saw with Optus, government, you know, no shortage of ministers lining up and being in the media, mm -hmm. giving all sorts of advice. And, and we kind of stayed true to our values and... You know, there were times where I'm sure government wanted us to say different things, and we we kind of resisted that. Yeah, that 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 independence is is a critical factor, and and not sort of I guess being on on either side of politics, but just being there for for the individual to help is is a really important thing. I mean that 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 leads to a sort of a follow up question, and I've probably got a few on this topic, but I guess you know dealing with millions of people being told to call your number. Uh, you know, I, I, I've, you know, I work in, in, in this space. I, you know, my, my firm, we have an incident response hotline that, that clients contact if they've got an incident and we've got a team that sits behind that hotline to get in touch with people, to, to offer them assistance and sort of project manage the response and provide them with legal advice. You know, how big's your team? How do you, how do you deal with the likes of an Optus or a Medibank telling millions of people to call your number? Do you need to go out and hire? How, how do you actually deal with it? Yeah, there's a, it's a logistical nightmare. No, so we, we, we've been, we've learned a lot of lessons from Optus, which has put us in good stead with obviously Medibank and now more recently Latitude. And, and the first is to create uh, 
a kind of a pyramid of response from our end. So the first, the base level is getting information online. That is the information people receive if they were to call our first level response. So looking at alternative ways to communicate the message becomes an important part of our work. Scaling for us is about tapping into resources that can help build our team. And so we have a bit of a reserve surge capability that we draw upon with these incidents where we're in the process and I'm physically in Sydney most of the time at the moment in, in setting up uh, another surge capability. And sadly, you know, we forecast that these won't be the last, there'll be more of these types of events. And, and I think the government's grappling with how it responds to ransomware attacks and, and these what we call mega mega breaches. But for us, practically, to go back to your question, it's about creating surge capability and surge infrastructure. So it hasn't been announced yet, but we are partnering with a, a very uh, well-reputed tertiary sector institution and, and we're creating a partnership with them in Sydney that taps into a much broader base of people to help us with our uh, incident response capability. And we're also with that partner developing a micro-credential for incident responders with a view to really getting them to tap into the expertise that we have in our experience, but also not in an underhanded way by any chance, but but also giving them the opportunity to, to donate and volunteer corporate time back into ID care as part of that surge capability and, and having them be part of our frontline incident response uh, case management team. And, and that idea came about very quickly with Optus. When Optus happened, we got phone calls from a number of very large corporates saying, Dave, what do you need? You know, how many people do you need? And and we couldn't take them because we hadn't trained them. It takes a it takes a degree of effort for us to get our case managers to a point where we can cut them loose on a phone. Mm. And so it, it made us reflect quite hard on well, well, if this happens next, what what, what have we got to lean back on? And so that's where the idea came to look at a tertiary partner and look at building a micro-credential and tapping into industry that can commit volunteer days with their staff uh, and, 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 again, add to our search capability. That's, that's terrific to hear. That, this is the first I've, I've heard of that. I, you know, being in the industry as long as I have, I have a suspicion who that might be, but I look forward to seeing the announcement in due course, and I think that's a, a wonderful idea because it, it is. You, you can't just sort of unleash untrained people to deal with these kinds of things. It's important that that people have had the, the relevant training and, and, and there is an ability to scale up. That's, you know, one of the challenges. I think that anyone who, who handles like a, a response hotline uh, ultimately has to deal with and, 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 you know, we've, we've adopted not, not through tertiary, but just through training, you know, the ability to scale up, you know, should a number of attacks or large, large attacks happen to, to handle incoming uh, calls. You know, I think so, something that might be of interest to people is is really what the the take up rate is that that you know you see and appreciate. It would really depend, I, I suppose, on how public an incident is, how many people are impacted. But you know, if you have a breach of say a million people and it's you know it gets into the papers, but it's not dominate dominating the nightly news. You know, what, what, you know, from a million people, I mean, how many people do you typically find actually contacting the organisation? Uh, typically less than 7%. So what, what, there's a number of things, you know, influence that result. So the media in part is some of that, but we find breaches involving employees have a much higher engagement rate. We find that the comms, the actual notification itself, will largely influence the uptake rate. So if the comms are lacking in precision or, or lacking in sufficient detail, then more people naturally will be engaging and going, what does this actually mean for me? So, mm. so there's a whole bunch of kind of variables we've learned over the last decade as to what influences uptake rate. Well, the, the question that we've been really focused on of late is what percentage of people who are notified believe they've actually experienced serious harm? And as you know, that's a threshold question in terms of the eligibility of of the breach and its notification of the regulator. And we've looked at cases of breaches in the last 12 months where there hasn't been any proactive remediation from government. So one of the 
outcomes of Optus we saw was government requesting the data and being able to share that with financial institutions. And see, that's that's a unique scenario because it's only a very recent kind of scenario. But we wanted to pick on breaches where that hadn't happened. We wanted to get an understanding of what's the what's the serious harm uptake, and and that in terms of both financial and and more the emotional and physical safety risks. And it was 0.08 percent, right? Of all, so you know, 99.2 percent didn't present with what they thought was a evidence of serious harm, and even those that did, uh, arguably. The attribution, for example, to a scam phone call or a scam email received uh, is really difficult uh, to, to, to sort of link that back to the breach because there's so much scam activity going on out there. It may not have anything to do with the breach. So we thought that was quite fascinating that that, you know, in, in the broad, so in 2022, when we look at those examples, that was the, the serious harm footprint. But we do get these statistical outliers. Like we're dealing with a breach at the moment that it, that's impacting a, a small business and the small business employees in particular, and half the employees have experienced misuse, so more than 50%. There was another, I remember there was another breach that impacted a financial services, sorry, a financial advisory service a few years ago now. And there was extreme misuse with that particular breach. And it was, in, it was, it was extreme in not just the numbers, it was extreme in the type of misuse. So there were people impacted by that breach who are having prohibited drugs imported in their name. Oh, wow. As an outcome. Now, we we don't see that in any risk of harm. <laughs> assessment. No. Uh, but there was an example of that happening. So, so certainly in the broad, in terms of the volume that we see, and of course, IDK sees a percentage of a percentage, but in the broad... Mm. I think it's a fair statement to say most people won't experience serious harm, but that's not the test. The test is anyone. You know, the test in terms of how the Privacy Act's written is a person, not yeah. not fifty percent of the people. So, yeah. so from that, I'm not diminishing that at all. I'm just sort of suggesting that you know I, we we find that quite interesting. That, that that that's fascinating. I mean, a number of the points that you just made there resonate with me. I I I took a a call from a potential client after Optus who, you know, w was certain that that they had been scammed because of their involvement in the Optus attack. And you know, it was just so difficult just listening to the facts. It was so di and and they'd been scammed out of sort of, you know, over a hundred thousand dollars. And and right. and it's an individual and they're telling me the facts and, you know, from a, a legal perspective, from an evidentiary perspective, it just would have been so hard to prove that this scam had occurred because of Optus and not because of some other possible scenario. And, you know, the legal test will be what, what what's like, you know, on the balance of probabilities, which means, you know, 50.1%. But even then it's just the, the possibilities are, are endless when it comes to, how scams can take place. It, it, it's really often difficult. I mean, the example that you gave about a, a cohort of employees and presumably tax file numbers and the like were uh, impacted. And, and if you can sort of see it's all coming from one breach and a number of people are impacted in a similar way, it's a lot easier to assess. But, but tip, that, that's really an outlier. Like you said, that that is not a common occurrence and it can be really difficult to attribute a scam or a fraud to a particular event. So, yeah, I'm seeing that from from the legal side. It happens all the time. I mean, we always want to try and help uh, impacted individuals out uh, where we can, but it, it, it does, you know, present a number of challenges. Uh, and then just just for, for the benefit of the listeners, yeah, the, David mentioned the legal test under the Privacy Act as it's currently drafted, and that is, you know, where there's access to information or disclosure of information and it's you know a reasonable person would conclude that it's likely going to result in serious harm which means more probable than not that's the threshold test and yeah it's difficult I, I can say david i've never advised anyone that a risk of them being impacted is that they're going to start importing drugs or drugs will be imported in their name so that's a new one i've never heard that in all the years i've done this so um, that that's fascinating you mentioned sort of some of the smaller organizations and i think that's a really important question here because, you know, we've talked a bit about Optus and, and, and Medibank and, and Latitude. These are really large businesses who have, 
you know, extensive resources behind them. They might have the benefit of insurance, although not, not all do, as I understand. Uh, and I guess what I'm interested in is, you know, where you have a small business that doesn't have significant resources behind them, you know, but for the benefit of the listeners, ID care is a not-for-profit. Um, at the same time, you've got staff, you've got overhead. So, so the, the organization needs to generate income to, to pay staff, to deal with, with other overheads that any organization has to deal with. And so, you know, I'm sure that, that, that government, you raised funds from government, you, I'm sure you raised funds from, from donors, and I'm sure that, that, that corporates who, who do need to engage the service do so uh, for a fee. And I guess what, what I'm really trying to get at is, you know, from your perspective, when, when should a small business be engaging ID care and, and sort of having a discussion with you about the costs involved in offering it to affected individuals compared with when is it okay for you know, a breached organization to tell you know, a handful of people, listen, here's, because uh, if you're an individual, you can contact ID care sure. without incurring a charge. It's a, it can be a free service to an individual. So I guess what's, what's your perspective on you know, when businesses should be formally engaging with ID care and, and, and sort of discussing pricing with, with the organization? Yeah, sure. So uh, small businesses, we treat as individuals. So individuals that come to ID care, it's a free service. We don't, we don't charge. That's the charitable nature uh, of our work and, and, and we don't need to know really anything about them. So that, that's another important point to make. When we designed case management, we designed it in a way that if we were breached, there's nothing to breach. Uh, there's a first name. Uh, the contact information that we have from people uh, gets disposed of every week. Uh, so there's really nothing there that's of, of value to a criminal. And that's been a very important design for us. Small businesses, we would get in excess of a thousand a year come to ID care. And, and we treat them very similar to how we treat individuals because there's not a huge distinction between the two. Often if a small business, particularly a micro business has been breached, they themselves as individuals have also been breached. So it's really hard to decouple the business from the person. And then obviously the flow on effect there is is the impacted customer if if obviously that's or the employees if that's part of of the breach context. So so we 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 tend to treat small businesses as if they are people. Corporates are different. So you mentioned ID care has costs. We do, <laughs> and <laughs> it's growing as the demand grows. But we we do ask that corporates, if they want ID care to support them with breach response, or they want ID care to support their customers or their employees, just in terms of additional services, that they provide a contribution towards the provision of that service. Unfortunately, we're not a charity that can receive donations, so. Right. When we did the feasibility study back in 2013, you mentioned it before, Eden, that you know back then cyber and scams and identity theft wasn't really on the public radar, mm. and we found the regulator at the time said, "Well, we you know we don't think there's a real charitable need for this, and yeah, we can see you're going to be a charity for educational purposes, but we won't make you a public benevolent institution, and therefore you can't receive donations." What's ironic about all of that is that we have a subsidiary that's fully owned by the charity in New Zealand that can receive donations. Uh, so, so we're a bit handicapped in Australia at the moment. Uh, and I say at the moment because we're, we're going to revisit it with the regulator very shortly yeah. uh, because it does deny us access to grants offered by industry oh. and government. We have to be a PBI. Now, that's that's the a bleeding heart scenario but in some respects it was actually a positive thing for us because when we set it up government said well dave we think you should go ahead we should you should be independent of government but by the way if you want us to support support you you're going to have to deliver a service that we want to buy and so it, it very quickly sharpened our focus on what are the services not just to the community but what are the services to government and industry that they're willing to invest in that we can then divert the revenue to support the community with. Hmm. So it, 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 it sort of grew from that. And that's why with going back to your question about when should corporates engage or how do we recover costs? It's, it is a cost recovery engagement for corporates when it comes to big breaches. It, it, it's still a pretty cheap <laughs> engagement when you think of the numbers that we have to deal with. 
but often often we find working with law firms like your own or others it is about giving those organizations that are advising our best advice on on the things that we see are the risks at any point in time and what the remediation opportunities are and what the content can look like from a from a notification perspective or, or from our perspective from a support lens and and they're the things that we encourage happen earlier than later you know there's been too many examples where uh corporates or their advisors have gone call id care and they've sent the notification and i've said oh gee we probably should tell id care that <laughs> and, and next thing you know thirty thousand people are wanting to engage us and we don't know anything about the breach yeah so you know our our advice and response to a question along those lines is please use us for what we see. There's no other place in the country that has the volume coming through that can really give you the heads up on what's happening today and and, and what are the response considerations uh, for impacted people. That's I think that's really helpful to to hear that sort of explanation from you. And I, I hadn't appreciated the the status of the the organization and, and, and that you couldn't accept donations. So um yeah that's that's gonna be something that I'll keep an eye on. I guess just just for the for, for those sort of people who are listening from corporates, hopefully they don't have a breach. If they do have a breach and 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 you know we're having a discussion about should I engage ID care, what do I get when I engage ID care? So what are the types of reporting or what, what do you provide to companies? who engage you that can assist them in the way that they manage the breach from, from, from a corporate perspective? Yeah, sure. So I think the, there's a few. One is uh, an independent assessment of what we see as the real risks and what are the remediation options available to people. So that's not coming at it from a corporate lens, that's coming at it from an impacted person lens. And that's pretty unique. So, so that type of immediate advice we find really narrows the focus for incident responders and advisors in our observation over the last decade rightly or wrongly we find incident response teams can fall into the trap of chasing risks and they're they're focusing on risks that aren't really there whereas what we can do is just give people a focal point to go actually here are the real risks and and here are the things that can be done about those risks or here are the things that can't be done about those risks so that's that's an important contribution. I think the other is if there's an escalata- escalatory consideration, ID care never wants to be the place where people just go. We only ever want to be the escalatory service. So what that means is that we don't run a call center, we don't run a, a number for any breached person to, to call without going to the breached organization. We've got really highly trained and specialist case managers whose bread and butter is dealing with complexity. Mm. And so we want to extend the opportunity for corporates to have an escalatory service as a result of that, not as a, as a frontline service. It takes six months to train our case managers. They're not call center staff. They're, they're experts. Some of them are trained qualified counselors and social workers and psychologists. So it's about learning how to use that so for some of the bigger breach we, men- we mentioned before uh, in September, October last year, they wanted to use ID care purely for customers that believe they're experiencing serious harm. Yeah. So they, they didn't want to use ID care for any kind of broader uh, outreach and, and support. They wanted to really focus on those cases that, that were presenting as, as, as the serious harm examples. And that's great. That's, that's what we're there to do. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, it's, it's wonderful to see the development of ID care over the years uh, and, and, and you know, you've, you've been the driving force, no doubt, with a great team around you, but, you know, you've, you've really been the driving force. So, um, you know, as someone who's in the area, you know, just really appreciate all the, the great work that you and the team do. You know, we've touched on some really important issues today. Really, I mean, we didn't even sort of dive into things around you know, how much data should should businesses be collecting? I think you flagged that issue and, you know, whether, you know, government IDs should be used to sign up to, you know, absolutely everything. You know, we've touched on 
the history of ID care and how it came to be and, and, and the risks that, that individuals face, how you support individuals, you know, the way that your team operates. I think it's been an incredibly insightful uh, discussion and just a really big thank you for taking the time uh, to come and speak with me today and, and, and share your experiences and uh, wisdom with, with those who listen. So really appreciate your time, David. For, for anyone who wants to, to know a bit more about ID care and read about the different services and you know, about the team and so forth, the website is idcare.org uh, and, 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 and there's lots of really uh, helpful information there. Aside from that, if anyone has any questions about today or um, would like to get in touch with me, I'm on LinkedIn or you can get in touch with me. My details are at the Hall and Wilcox website, which is hallandwilcox.com.au. Uh, if you enjoyed today's episode, please rate, review and follow our podcast on whatever platform you listen. Uh, you can subscribe on the website to be notified of new episodes. Thank you, David. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Uh, stay cyber safe. Thanks, David. Great to be in the zone.